So today we're going to talk a little bit about SAT and TOEFL testing. And the way that we're going to kind of approach this is just as more of an overview. So we're going to talk about the SAT, we're going to talk about TOEFL, but we're going to start more with why you should think about taking these tests and why they're very important for you. So just to kind of get, a, get an overview, the SAT is an acronym and it stands for the Scholastic Aptitude Test. And basically it's intended to assess a student's readiness for college. Every year over 3 million students take this test at over 700 locations throughout the entire world. So lots of people take it. TOEFL, on the other hand, is the test of English as a foreign language and is designed to measure proficiency of non-native English language speakers who wish to enroll at, I've written US universities, but really who wish to enroll at universities and study in the English language throughout the world. So that's kind of our baseline. So the first question that a lot of international students ask is, do I need these tests? You might hear a lot of different information about this. Some people might tell you yes. Some people might tell you no. Generally, the answer is yes. You need at least one of them. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But right now what's important, many US colleges and universities require scores on both of these tests. However, a growing number of schools are starting to move away from that and are requiring less. So like I said, some require scores on one test, some require scores on both tests, some require no scores. So in order to figure this out, the question now becomes, where do you look? And my best advice for you is twofold. First, you should definitely look at the web page for international student admissions. That should give you a clear picture of what types of tests are required. Now, along with that, if you, ha if you have trouble navigating that website, the next step would be to email the International Student Admissions Advisor. So those are, the, those are the steps that you should take, first and foremost. So these are some examples of the types of requirements that universities might have. Ohio University, the university that I work at, where I advise students, the TOEFL test is always required, but the SAT is only required for people thinking about specific majors. Those include the College of Business, the College of Communication, and certain science majors. It's be, this is because those majors are more competitive. Michigan State University, another university I'm very familiar with, it's a little bit different. They only require that students demonstrate English proficiency, and you can do that through the TOEFL or the SAT. So you can take either. At Denison University, my undergraduate university, if the TOEFL score is high enough at Denison, you're not required to take the SAT. If your TOEFL score is too low, then you are. Then another university that I'm very familiar with, Boston University, they require both tests. So as you can see, every school is different. And that's why it's so important to check the internet and you know, really, really do your research before you start applying to schools. You certainly wouldn't want to be in a situation where you're applying to schools and somewhere you really want to go requires a test that you haven't taken. So other considerations to think about with these tests, basically, my, my mantra here is that even though these tests may not be required, you should probably still take both of them. And the reason is, first of all, scholarship eligibility. Even though some universities will not require the SAT and the TOEFL test, the fact of the matter is that the better score that you can get on these tests, the more money that you're going to have a chance to compete for. Scholarship funding is competitive, and anything that you can do to make yourself look better is something that you should definitely be focusing on. And similarly, these tests, if you do well on them, can offer better opportunities for admission. The more competitive the school, the better the application you will need. You're competing against a lot of students, 
so the test scores can set you apart. If unsure, take both tests. That's my advice. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the, the tests more specifically. So the SAT, what does it measure? Basically, it has three sections, critical reading, mathematics, and writing. And broadly, the SAT tests students' reasoning based on knowledge and skills developed through their coursework. So the stuff that you're doing right now in high school, hopefully that's going to carry over and turn into a really good SAT score for you. It measures students' ability to analyze and solve problems by applying what they've learned in school. So I've created this little, um, this little chart here, breaking down kind of how the SAT works. So you've got three sections. Three of them are scored, critical reading, math, and writing. The critical reading section is 70 minutes, and it's broken down into three different sections. And we'll talk about the different sections later. Math, three different sections for a total of 70 minutes. And then writing, two multiple choice sections, and then one 25-minute essay. Then you'll see down here where it says variable section. What this represents is a it's a section of the test that the, the people who wrote the test kind of put on the test as a way to make sure that to test future questions. So you're not scored on that section. You still have to take it because you don't know which one it is, but it's an unscored section. A lot of times when you take the SAT, you'll come out of the test thinking that one section was very difficult. And oftentimes, it will be the variable section because they're testing those questions. So as for the content of the SAT, we're going to start with critical reading. And there's two types of questions in the critical reading section. The first, is, the first type are passage-based reading questions. And really what you're going to be doing here is reading a, a, a moderately lengthy pa passage. And you're going to be performing lots of different multiple choice actions with these, pa these passages. You'll be determining the meanings of words. Um, they'll be testing your understanding of information, um, your ability to analyze information, um, identifying the, the author's use of cause and effect, your ability to make inferences, your understanding of logic, um, of analogies and arguments, and your ability to understand and evaluate the author's assumptions and techniques. On the other side of the critical reading spectrum, you're going to be looking at sentence completion questions. So basically, in this area, you're going to have questions. And they will present you with a sentence that has one or more blanks. And with each blank, you will need to indicate something that has been omitted. So basically, you'll have to choose words to complete a sentence and find the words that are the best fit. A lot of times, this can be kind of difficult because a lot of words will fit, but you have to find the best fit. In order to do well on this section, you'll need to have a knowledge of the meanings of words and kind of an understanding of how different parts of sentences fit together logically. So that's it for my overview of reading. Now on to math. I just have one slide here because math is not my strong suit. but um, this is the kind of the kind of stuff you're going to have to be dealing with. Uh, multiple choice items and some student produced responses, meaning that you think responses that you actually write in with a pencil. You'll be dealing with number and operations, algebra one and two, different types of functions, geometry, statistics, probability, and data analysis. Um, you won't find calculus on the math section of the SAT, so that'll be, that's a relief for a lot of American students, at least. On to writing, which I found has been one of the more difficult sections for international students in my career. Um, you're going to have two types of questions. You're going to have two multiple choice sections and one essay. The multiple choice questions measure the student's understanding of how to use language in a clear, consistent manner how to revise and edit, and how to recognize an error in a sentence. The student written essay is exactly what it sounds like. You will write a 25-minute essay, 
and it measures your use of language, your logical presentation of ideas, the way you develop your point of view, and the way that you are able to express yourself clearly. And of course, this is all timed, which makes it a little bit more pressurized and a little bit more difficult. So because this is a difficult test, and it's, it's a difficult test for native speakers, so for international students, it presents its own set, set of challenges. The question is how to prepare. Generally speaking, the best way to prepare for this test is to start early and to challenge yourself throughout high school and take rigorous courses, which I'm sure all of you are doing, and definitely focus on math. You need to read and write as much as possible in English, both in and outside of school. And you should familiarize yourself with the SAT so that you know what to expect on test day. And I'm going to provide some options for that in the next um, couple of slides. And then finally, along with that, you need to familiarize yourself with the different types of questions like we've just done. And you need to really focus on the directions for the questions and understand how the test is scored. And another thing we'll talk about in a second. So when studying for the SAT, the best way to begin is probably with an SAT study guide. Most study guides contain practice tests, test taking tips, and other explanatory passages about the test in general. While most books contain these general broad sections, and you could really buy any book geared towards the SAT to learn these things. There are some books that are actually much better than others. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of those. So from my experience, the best study guide for the SAT is actually the, the official SAT study guide that is produced by College Board, who administers the SAT. It's probably the best overall book because it, it covers everything that needs to be covered. It has realistic test questions, and it actually has eight full tests within the book. The biggest issue or problem with this book is that the, many students have said that the tests are a little bit easier than the actual SAT. So once you've used this book and gone through some of the tests, you might want to move on to one of these two books. The Princeton Review publishes two books that are really great for practice tests, especially the, the practice tests for SAT book, which people have considered to have the best practice tests. And what that means is the most challenging and also the most realistic. So what you see in this book will be very similar to what you would see on the actual SAT test. If you're looking for test taking tips, which are important, it's not just knowing the material, but it's also knowing how the test operates and what the testers expect of you. I would definitely recommend reading up on test taking tips. This is a great book for that. It's Kaplan SAT. Um, I have a picture of the 2011 book. It's been updated for 2013 and 14. So find the new one if you can. And it just kind of familiarizes students with the format and offers a lot of really good testing strategies. Um, the four practice tests in the book are also really good, but the key, the key here is the testing strategies. And finally, I've listed um, some online resources for SAT prep. One of the options when prepping for one of these tests, um, and something that most American students do, is to take a official test preparation course. I've linked to um, in these links, I've linked to, to some of that, those, those types of courses here. We don't recommend any specific course, but a test preparation course is probably the most um, comprehensive way to prepare for a test like this. So you might hear, while you're applying for colleges, a little bit about SAT subject tests. I'm just going to cover them briefly here, because most of you won't have to deal with this. But basically what these are, are 20 specific tests that come from one of five categories, English, foreign language, history, mathematics, and science, that, that aim to test your knowledge in these specific areas. Um, each test contains a series of questions designed to measure your knowledge in one of these subjects. And the scores are often used by colleges for admission into specific programs, placement in freshman level courses, 
or just for, for some very highly competitive colleges that may want to get a little bit more of an idea about the knowledge of their applicants. Most colleges don't require these tests, so you should definitely check with your prospective institutions to find out about their requirements. But it's highly unlikely that you would need these, but you should always have them in the back of your mind. So, scoring, everyone's favorite topic. Currently, the SAT is scored on a 2,400 point scale. So each section is worth 800 points. You receive one point for answering a question correctly, but for getting a question wrong, you lose one quarter of a point. So what this means is that there's actually a penalty on this test for guessing. So it's very important when you take this test, if you, if you really have no idea of an answer, sometimes it's better to leave it blank. This is something that you will read a lot more about when you either take a prep class or purchase the um, Test Taking Strategies book. This is one of the unique features of the SAT. Beyond that, there is no minimum score to pass the SAT. You can't pass it, and you can't fail it. Universities and colleges and institutions accept many different kinds of scores depending on the school, depending on the kinds of grades you have, and depending on other factors. So no matter how you do on the test, you, know, you can rest assured that you did not fail it. So that's a very important um, distinction between this and a lot of other tests that you may, that you may take. And I've just included a, a bell curve here um, of the SAT scoring, just to get an idea of where students fall um, on each individual section. So on average, as you can see here, students average about a 500 on each section of the SAT. That would be average. And that would mean an average student would receive a 1,500 out of 2,400. Um, the farther you get to the right, 600, 700, 800, um, you know, the more elite company you are in. So those are definitely the numbers to shoot for, if you can. So finally, where can you take it? Test centers are located throughout most of Europe, um, although unfortunately not currently in Belarus to the best of our knowledge. You should probably consider taking the test in Russia, Lithuania, Latvia, Finland, Poland, or Estonia, or any other continental European country, Great Britain, or Ireland that you um, plan to be in. The website listed on the bottom of this slide is a search function on the College Board website that will tell you where tests are offered, what the test dates are, how much they cost, and that kind of thing. So now that we've, at least for the moment, finished with our discussion of the SAT, we will move on to TOEFL. So again, this is taken by students aspiring to study in the United States who um, speak a, who's, who are not native English speakers. The test is offered quite a bit, 30 to 40 times a year at 4,500 locations in over 150 countries. Over 8,500 colleges and universities accept TOEFL, um, and almost every American university accepts TOEFL. And at this point, you'll be taking the internet test so format, this is a four hour test. It has four sections. And each, each of these sections attempts to measure one of the basic language skills. So reading, listening, speaking, and writing. For reading, the TOEFL reading section consists of four to five passages. Each is about 700 word in, words in length. And you'll be answering questions about those passages. Generally speaking, these passages are going to focus on academic topics. So what they're testing here is not your ability to read a English language crime novel, which would be fun, but that's not what they're doing. They're trying to test your ability to function in an academic setting where English is the language of instruction. So you'll find questions that focus on um, main ideas, on small details, on inferences, on sentence insertion, vocabulary. This reading section is going to be somewhat similar um, to the SAT reading section, although the topics will be a bit different. Listening. So this consists of six passages that are about three to five minutes in length. 
and then questions about those passages. Two of them will be student conversations, which will be somewhat academic in nature, but also have to do with personal issues and personal life, student life outside of academia. And then four of the questions will be academic lectures or discussions, four of the passages. So basically, the con each conversation involves two speakers, a student and either a professor, a campus service provider, or another student. And the, the lectures are kind of self-contained portions of academic lectures. So you're not going to need to have any outside information to understand these things. You should be able to understand what's going on just from the information within the passage. So the speaking test, this, um, in my experience, is the test that a lot of um, students have trepidation about. But there's really no reason for that. The speaking section consists of six tasks, two independent tasks and four integrated tasks. So basically, in the independent tasks, the test takers kind of answer opinion questions on familiar topics. And this means kind of non-academic stuff. So as you can see, there's a pattern forming. Generally speaking, you're going to have a couple non-academic items and then three or four academic items. As you can see, the academic stuff is definitely the focus of this test, but at the same time, they want to know that you can interact in other more le less formal ways also. That being said, the integrated tasks, of course, will be more academic in nature and focus on course lectures, conversations about campus life, and things of that nature. The writing section. This measures a test taker's ability to write in an academic setting. And again, consists of two tasks, one integrated and one independent. The integrated task um, asks the test taker to read a passage on an academic topic and then listen to a speaker discuss the same topic. The independent task um, asks the writer to write an essay that states and explains and supports their opinion on an issue. So I mean, the, when dealing with this test, there's a lot more in-depth information that you're going to need about it. This is just a, a slight overview. So in order to get that information, the question is, what are you going to do? Well, before we get to that, though, we're going to do a quick breakdown. Um, so TOEFL, reading, listening, speaking, and writing, like I talked about. Um, three to five passages in the reading section with 12 to 14 questions. Listening, six to nine passages with five to six questions. Speaking, six tasks, six questions, 20 minutes. And then writing, two tasks and two questions, all for a total of four hours. And as I'm sure you're interested in, scoring, TOEFL provides five scores. You're going to get one score for each section and then a cumulative total score. Each section is scored on a 0 to 30 scale. And the cumulative score will be 0 to 120. And then your score is good for two years. And do a little bit of a, a little bit of an idea about the scoring. Again, you can't pass or fail this test. But different universities require different scores. The university I work at only requires a 65 for an international student. There are some universities that require 90 or 100. So it just depends on the university. And you'll want to check with the international admissions website, with your international admissions advisor, to make sure that you're looking at the correct information and shooting for the right score. So now, um, as I got a little ahead of myself earlier, we're going to talk about preparing for the TOEFL. First and foremost, um, ETS, who administers TOEFL, recommends the comprehensive online TOEFL course. This is something that can be extremely helpful. And I would definitely recommend at least looking into it. If you're not looking for a comprehensive course, you might want to consider these two TOEFL preparation guides, which seem to be favored by students, the official Cambridge TOEFL guide published by ETS. We have copies of this in our office, and it's a great book. It's a good way to get started. 
after you've been studying for a while and you're looking for something a little bit different, you might want to think about the Longman Preparation Course. Students especially enjoy the practice tests with this particular publication. The nice thing about the TOEFL for you is that you can take it in Minsk. I have posted a link here that you can click and you should be able to pretty easily figure out the dates, the times, and the places for this test. So basically this whole presentation has had three main points and then one thing that I'd like to stress. First of all, you need to check to see what each institution requires. Do not assume. If one institution requires one thing, one might require the other, as I depicted in my graphic earlier. So ask. If you're unsure, please ask. Second of all, even if institutions that you are applying to do not require both of these tests, you should probably take them because they could help you with admissions even though they're not required. And more importantly, really, they can help you get scholarship money. And for, for US students and international students alike, scholarship money is probably the most important thing. The third point is to study for these tests. Don't just walk into the testing room and take them. These tests, the scores that you receive, become part of your permanent record with these companies and with universities. And you don't want them to see a poor score simply because you weren't able to study. If you've scheduled a test and you did not study for it, your best bet would be to reschedule. And finally, and this is important, that's why I saved it for the end, retake these tests if you need to or if you think you need to. If you think you didn't do as well as you could, if something happened on test day to impact your performance, these tests can be retaken. And most universities, not all, but most, will take your highest score. In fact, there are some that will take your highest score from each section and put it together to make one ultimate high score. So definitely plan to retake these tests if you think that you may need to.